whenever I, I started, to, I, I talked about my um, PhD thesis, I was always asked this question about Tahrif. So that's why I decided to uh, continue with this um, with this topic. Even in my viva, when I was doing viva, that's the question I was asked. Well, why why did you include Tahrif? Because people often confuse that you know what, when, whenever you talk about Shia Quran or uh, you know Ali Nabi Talib's Codex, they always think that it's about Tahrif, that the Quran was Tahrif. So this is an important uh, topic, and what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to um, talk about you my research because it's just now I'm just reviewing the literature and also looking at the sources and I started with the Sunni sources because uh, there are also traditions in the Sunni sources about uh, Tahrif, Tahrif of the Quran they don't call it Tahrif but more or less it's considered Tahrif so I'm going into those Bukhari, Muslim, um, Malik's Muwatta trying to find relevant um, traditions and in the end, what I'm going to do is to put together all the traditions about Tahrif. And I'm using this methodology, it's called Isnad Kometin, to just compare the, the Isnad transmission <laughs> of these traditions and the text. And try to understand, try to come up with some analysis. But today, I, I'm going to talk about more... Um, historical aspect of Tahrif and different opinions on the Tahrif. Okay, let's move on. Okay, what's the falsification of Tahrif? That's the translation. And there, there is a verse in the Quran, two, there are two verses, and there are other verses about Tahrif. Falsification, Tahrif, same thing, or distortion of the Quran. So the verse reads, you know, the, the giving the, uh, from the previous nations, and Jews and the Christians, how they distorted their um, book texts. So, <clears throat> just summarizing this, there are, you know, in, in, if you look at the books, there are many forms of uh, distortion, tahrif, or falsification. But overall, there are two types of it. One is a literal meaning of distortion, means that you change the verses, like you know, verses of the Quran, literally, you omit them. You interpolate, so you change physically, go there and play with the verses of the Quran, or you change the meaning, conceptual concepts, playing with the concepts. And the, in the Quran, it mostly talks about uh, Quran mostly talks about um, the con co um, um, distorting the concepts in the Quran. You know, Jews, you know, the the Sabbath, they were asked to uh, not. Uh, uh, um, not the fish, and then they, you know, trick. They find a way to uh, get away with it. So those kind of things in the Quran mention that you know, changing the meaning, giving it a wrong meaning, allocating certain verses, certain words, uh, a meaning that is not meant by God, but just to, for their advantage, advantage. And this is done also by, you know, when they are doing tafsir, uh, the translating or interpreting the Quran by asserting individual opinions. It's the same, similar kind of um, <clears throat> action. So today I, I won't be talking about the in, uh, changing or distorting the, the concepts or the meaning. I'll be talking about the literal, uh, inter, uh, literal falsification of the Quran. And this is like, there are ways of doing it. There are, you know, one way is to, to Add things into the Quran, adding verses. Um, or the, the other way is the most common or mostly accepted view is to, to excluding, omitting names or verses from the Quran. Because majority of those who believe in Tahrif, both in Shia and Sunni, uh, they, they, they believe omission. They don't believe, nobody believes in adding something to the Quran, Quranic text, except the a group in Khawarij. They believe that Surah Yusuf is, is not supposed to be there. It's just addition because it's a love story. Looks like a love story. So they just uh, discard it. They, they ignore it. They say this is just added later on. But of course, there's very, even, even Khawarij, it's, they're, they're a very marginal group. But there are, within the Shiism and Sunnism, 
people, scholars believe that certain things have been taken out from the Quran. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, why is it important to study? Of course, one is the most important uh, reason is to, of course, the textual history of the Quran. So if the Quran is distorted, falsified, we have a big problem, Muslims have a big problem, and they have to come to terms with it. And it's, it's going to affect when the Quranic text came into existence, and when, and how, because currently some scholars argue that the Quranic text came into existence during the Umayyad period, Marwan, you know, Hajjaj, and they are responsible for uh, distorting the Quran. And many scholars argue so, but th that means that the previous traditions, previous um, narrations on the textual history of the Quran, on the collection of the Quran, is, is problematic. So one aspect is regarding textual history of the Quran. The second aspect is Shin, uh, Shia Sunni polemics and sectarian rhetoric. Now, if you follow those uh, uh, forums, Facebook groups, Twitter, um, or sectarian websites, first thing you would come up as, as Imam, of course, and then second, or maybe some, this comes first, is Tahrif. Shias always, you know, Shia, Shias are accused of believing that the Quran is falsified or distorted by the by the Umayyads or Sunnis later on. And this, this topic is, is always uh, is to comes up and, and it it's just escalates. So it's, it's, from the, from, for understanding this, this issue is important to sometimes resolve or deal with the situation. Um, this, is, this was very important because I was reading a book um, by a Western scholar well, not the exact book, it's, it's written in German, but part of it was he translated and published in English. He, did a, he, he covered this um, Shia-Sunni relations historically. And what he found is that this tahrif is, is always comes when, when there's a Shia-Sunni rapprochement, it always brought up to, to stir, stir the, the relations and the cause conflict. Because usually it's believed that you know this tahrif is um, it's 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 always it's been always there and just Shias try to you know um, ease it, try to you know make it um, try to play it down so that they can have a you know relations with the Sunnis. But it doesn't work like that. You know in his research, what happens is first this relationship relationship here he found that you know. Um, you know, in, especially in 1950s, between, in Egypt, they established this institution, Jamaat Taqrib Bain al madaib and between Shias and Sunnis, and Shaltut. Um, <coughs> it, it was very much supported with the Shia Marjai, Buru a very prominent um, Shia Marjai Taqlid. He was in Iran, he, was, he supported this, this um, movement, and um, in the end, the Mahmoud Shaltut, he was a very, a very prominent Sunni scholar, acknowledged Shi Islam, Shiism as the fifth Madaib of Islam. So it was officially established. And after that, when this happened, during this time, when this rapprochement was taking place, a Salafi scholar, Muhib al-Din, uh, <coughs> Muhib al-Din uh, al-Khatib, he provoked it. He actually came up with this uh, publication on Tahrif, focusing on Tahrif, and um, it caused a big stir. And all the legacy, now we have all this discussion about Tahrif, is due to him. That, you know, the Salafi scholar, and now you go to Salafi Wahhabi websites, or the publications, they all copy him. And he is the responsible for this um, stir up about Tahrif, this spark about Tahrif, because up to this point there was nothing, just the small discussions. So in order to understand this, this issue also, discussion of Tahrif is important. Okay, uh, as I said, there are both in Shiism and Sunnism scholars 
minority of scholars believe in this distortion of the Quran. And it, as far as Shism is concerned, there are two views. One is the Akhbari view, one is the Usuli view. When I say Akhbari, of course, not all of the Akhbari, not all Akhbari scholars support this view. But there is a group of Akhbari scholars. You know, Akhbari, what I mean Akhbari is, those who don't know, are the scholars or school of thought, they believe only in uh, Quran and validity of Quran and Sunnah. In, 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 in when they interpret the religion, when they understand religion, when they issue fatwas, but well, they don't issue fatwas, I suppose. Yeah, it's only Quran and Sunnah. And there's the Usuli uh, school of thought within Shiism. They use reasoning and consensus in addition to Quran and Sunnah. So there has been, um, you know, the, throughout the history, there has been conflict between these two schools, and currently the Usuli is the prominent, and most Usuli has been always the dominant power. Anyways, this Akhbari has been the minority, and they are literalists. They accept uh, traditions, and there are traditions. If you look at the old texts, I'll talk about those. Based on those texts, they believe that parts of the Quran, or maybe uh, most of the Quran, was falsified or distorted. Okay, the main argument the, the main argument, aside from the existence of those traditions, they use those who believe in tahrif is, from the Shia point of view, a lack of the, the, the absence of the names of the infallible, infallibles in the Quran. Because they, they, when the argument is that when you look at the Quran, you hear about the previous prophets, their wives, it, their daughters, sons, you know, detailed information about their children, their um, family, but there's no name of the Quran, uh, the, the, there's no, no mention, very, very limited mention to the Prophet and his family in the Quran. So for Shias, it's a very, you know, easy to accept this argument. And there are four times mentioning the Prophet in the Quran, Muhammad, and then there's nothing else. So <clears throat> this is the main argument that they use in order to justify, of course, there are many technical arguments, you know, they go, you know, uh, verse by verse, different verses, you know, there's this verse is missing, is, uh, Imam Ali's name is missing here, you know, the uh, verse of Valaya, for example, and there are other verses, but uh, in terms of rationality, this is the rationale, that lack of the names of the infallibles in the Quran. And of course, they have plenty of, uh, traditions in their disposal, starting from the 3rd century uh, Hijra, uh, Sayyari, this is the key book, um, and then 3rd century Nishaburis and Bargi Bar Kumni, most Kumni scholars, Kulaini, it's even in Kulaini, these, uh, these traditions, and um, very important works include these traditions regarding the falsification of the Quran. Just choose, I've chosen a couple of um, traditions. One tradition is, uh, is again, Sayyari's Kitab al Qur'at. He's the famous book. It's all about uh, the collection of the traditions on the so-called falsification of the Quran. And later on, his scholars took it from him, is his work. You see, they have been raised from the Quran the names of 70 people belong to the tribe of Quraysh, along with the names of their fathers, and only the name of Abu Lahab was left there in order to humiliate the Prophet, since Abu Lahab was his paternal uncle. This is uh, reportedly coming from Ali ibn Abi Talib, and in, in, it exists in those books. So it's not just the names of the infallibles, but also their enemies, they are arguing. According to his uh, Akhbari, uh, Akhbaris, the pro enemy of the prophets and the imams are also mentioned in the Quran. And their names were taken out for political reasons. And <clears throat> this is a sample verse, how it's supposed to be, they argue. This Ali is dropped. This is the original verse in the Quran. Uh, Quran chapter 5 and 60, 67. 
or a messenger announced that which has been revealed to you from your Lord concerning Ali. And if you do not, then... So, in those works, that Sayyari's work and other early works, they say this is dropped from the Quran for political reasons. And this is the now original uh, <coughs> verse in the Quran. Okay. Before... But I'm just now giving information. It doesn't mean that I agree or anything, just, uh, just mentioning those traditions, trying to uh, look at the, the historical uh, <coughs> arguments or uh, traditional arguments for that. Okay. It's been generally believed that, you know, when you go to these arguments, I, I, I've come across on the, you know, Facebook groups or scholarly groups, it's always this, this tahri for distortion of the Quran is attributed to Shias. But there are um, groups within the Sunni Islam, minority again like the Shia Islam, and they also argue the same argument. That parts of, well, not in the same, con uh, in the same context, because the Shia argument is that to, to, in order to hide the, the, or um, usurp the right of Ali ibn Abi Talib and then the, the Imams, the, the, the other Imams, Shias deliberately carried out, so Sunnis deliberately carried out this distortion to expunge these names and these proofs from the, 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 the most important text in Islam. In the Sunni, or this, uh, well, if I say Sunni, I'm not attributing it, I don't want to attribute it in general, but there are there's a certain school, Hashviya, it's equivalent of Akhbari, the literalist group. They take only the literal meaning of the traditions and the Quran. They accept, again, only the Hadith and the, the Quran, and then they don't care about anything else. And they take the meaning, if the Hadith is uh, sound, even if Habar al-Wahid, they accept it, they accept the meaning. And there are traditions that, that somehow indicates that Quran was distorted after the Prophet's demise. So <coughs> they are called in Shia Islam, they are called Akhbari, and the equivalent of his Hashviya, and it's a, the school of Hadith. But it's a very derivative, it's not like Akhbari, it's more uh, derivative uh, meaning. And there are these traditions, and they didn't make, because the, the main problem with the, this Hashviya is that they, even if it's Khabar al-Wahud, or as an isolated tradition, they have to accept it. And there are traditions in Bukhari, in you know, some of the earliest and Sahih Sunni sources, that some of the, the verses missing in the Quran, like a uh, verse of uh, stunning, Omar, the, the, the second caliph, very adamant that there was a verse in the Quran about stunning that Prophet, Prophet uh, peace be upon him, um, uh, ordered it and it, it, it was as, as a, uh, recited it as a part of the Quran, but it wasn't included in the Quran. And uh, this uh, breastfeeding, there's another verse, and they said these traditions were part of Surah Ahzab. And it was longer than Surah Baqarah. Surah Baqarah is around 286, and Ahzab is around 70, I think. So it means that more than 200 verses are missing from the Quran, according to these traditions. And this happened after the Prophet passed away. So it's kind of tahrif, because if the Prophet did it, okay, there was no problem with it. He could. You know, you could put it, you know, uh, justified as an abrogation. <coughs> Prophet had this authority. But after he passed away, you can't do this. If you do it, then that's, um, that's tahrif. So, <coughs> there is the, from the, from, this is the, what the uh, Sunni perspective, and um, there are traditions narrated from Abdullah ibn Masood, Aisha, and Abdullah ibn Abbas, because one of the problem with the with the Quran, with the well, textual history of the Quran, not of course with the Quran, there is no <laughs> problem. The textual history of the Quran, there are many copies, codices, 
different uh, Sahaba or the companions of the Prophet. They wrote their own copies. And there was dispute, and some of them were burnt, and there were grievances. So the Muslims never uh, come to terms with, uh, you know, openly discuss this textual history of the Quran. And the problem partially because of this, because of that uh, issues. Okay, one sample tradition. Uh, this is from... Yes, okay. This is about Ubaid uh, Niqab. Um, told me that how many verses does Surah Ahzab contain? Either 73 verses or 74. And Ubaid ibn, ibn Niqab said it was Surah Al Ahzab either as long as Surah Al Baqarah or longer than it. And the verse of Rajim was in it. And I asked, what is the verse of Rajim? Uh, and then he said, if all men see this verse, is is claimed to be part, was, was part of Quran and it was removed after the Prophet. And the Sunnis justified some of the Sunni scholars, not all of course, not all of the Sunni scholars believe, like um, some of the Sunni scholars, they believe that it was abrogated. Uh, its ruling is there, but its wording is abrogated. So it can happen after even Prophet passed away. They, they somehow justify it. And there is another verse, Another, sorry, another tradition. And this is from uh, the second caliph, Umar ibn Khattab. You see here, this is also, this tradition also gives clue what's going on here. This is an important tradition because this is a tradition, it's a very long tradition, and it's kind of uh, mutawatir because he goes in the you know, khutbah, he de 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 delivers a sermon, and he talks about the succession issue. And he famously calls the succession issue as the falta. When Abu Bakr's succession, he's saying this falta means in Arabic, it means uh, rushed. It's rushed decision. It wasn't like deliberately uh, set up. So after mentioning this in the same tradition, he continues with the wrong accounts of the event. So here he says, I mean, I've grown old and my strength has weakened. My posture, posture is scattered, and take me to, well, he is, uh, without exception, I'm either entered in the Medina and addressed the people. He said, oh people, the custom has been established for you, obligations have been placed upon you, you have been left on the clear path unless you misled, and it goes. And here is important that I am I'm not afraid that people would say, Omar ibn Khattab added it in the book, it, the book of God, the exalted, I would have written it in the Quran. This is the verse, again, same verse. Is, is, he is very sure about it, that mature man, Shaykh and Shaykh, uh, uh, Shaykh um, when they commit adultery. Okay, yeah, this is the verse. So, what is happening here probably because of his old age? There's a tr tradition about this. Same tradition is reported from... Um, uh, what's his name? Zayd, uh, the one of the yeah, Zayd bin Thabit. But this is attributed to Prophet. So because of his old age, he's anyway in the beginning of the tradition. He's mentioning it. He's I'm losing my strength. So probably because of his old age, he is confusing the tradition with the verse of the Quran. But I mean, this is okay. It might happen, but the problem is the latest scholars accept this as authentic tradition and they argue based on this they argue that the Quran this verse is missing from the Quran and it was it happened after the demise of the Prophet okay this is a, this is was a historical aspect of it and the currently in the last couple of centuries it, it's there was no issue I mean, there was no the Shia scholars, in terms of Shia scholars, and both Sunni scholars, they denied or rebuked this, this idea of falsification. Even the, some of the uh, Akbari scholars, they also denounced this view that the Quran, because this is the core of the faith, the Quran. And if you bring, the, the argument is that if you start uh, doubting, regarding, you know, there are verses in the Quran that, you know, it's, it says that the, it, God protects it, and Despite of all these um, 
issues, you start you know, coming up with this kind of ideas that the Quran is falsified, then you're destroying the religion. So based on that, both Shia and Sunni scholars, great majority of them um, denounced this view. But there, is a, there are, of course, exceptions. And one of the famous exceptions is Muhaddith Nuri and Fast al-Kitab, Fi Kitab Rabb al-Arbab, and um, Tabarsi or Tabrisi or Muhaddith Nuri, very famous uh, Hadith scholar, 19th century. And he wrote this book. And this book, of course, draws very strong criticism among the, Sunni, among the Shia scholars and the refutations were, were written. And then later on, he wrote another uh, um, answer to the refutations, counter uh, arguments. But he backtracked from his, his view. He said, in the end, Abu uh, Tihrani, he said he, he was his student. He, 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 in, in the book, he, <coughs> in his book, when he discussed this book, Abu Tihrani, he says, in, in the private conversation, he said his intention was not to promote the idea of tahrif, but it turned out like that. So he, he kind of uh, backtracked. But this book later on, this is called the big, big uh, problem within the sh Shia world, and later on picked up by the, some of the Wahhabi and Salafi, uh, Salafis, and then this view, now the, as I, in the beginning of the discussion, I said, okay, there was this uh, Egyptian scholar who wrote this uh, booklet, uh, Salafi scholar, he took most of the ideas from this book to justify his arguments. He cited this book constantly. So <clears throat> in order to, to, to justify that Shias believe in the distortion of the Quran. OK, now this is my, um, my work. My research is based on, this is the prelude, the whole discussion. The, 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 my research. OK, what I've been doing now, giving you different uh, traditions, different views of, um, diff diff view opinions of different scholars on the issue. But what hasn't been done is to comparatively analyze these traditions with a, with a methodology, with a methodology of hadith study that is that is like, that can come up, that, that can be something new. Because the problem is that there are some, some traditions, as I, as I showed you a few of them, they are, some of them are believed to be mutawatir, but then not, not, not of them, very few of them. Mostly they are habar al-wahid, or isolated traditions. So if they are isolated traditions, you don't believe in, but, but, but the, you don't, you, you're not, according to most of the Usuli scholars, you don't accept them. However, if, if in Hashviyyah, as I mentioned, in Sunni, um, Sunnis and Akhbaris, they accept it in, in the Shias. So, and then in order to counter it, they say, okay, this is all the same dispute. Dispute is whether you take Habar al-Wahid or isolated, the, 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 you know the Habar al-Wahid or isolated tradition is, is coming from one, um, one chain of narration is basically I can put it like that. So this whole dispute is whether you accept Khabar al-Wahid, our isolated traditions or not. This is like circle, and then it comes up. Okay, once the the, the arguments come, or the so, so and so scholar accepted it, and then uh, he, s some scholars didn't accept it. So this is like this has been going on this issue of tahrif, like this. You know, the circular arguments citing the back uh, previous scholars, and then if there's a dispute, picking those traditions. So what I wanted to do in my research is that, of course, probably I'm hoping that I'm going to clarify the issue, but then it's going to, of course, not be clarified. I'll make it more complicated bringing another view. This is what happens usually. To implement this new methodology that I use in my uh, PhD is it's not combating. Instead of just looking at basically how I can uh, sum up is that, Instead of just looking at Isnad, looking at the Metin as well, and then comparatively looking at them and then trying to, to just, trying to date those traditions and then try to find the period when they came, when did they, uh, or when uh, they come into existence and try to find, hist like, it's like kind of um, police investigation, criminal investigation, try to find who's responsible for disseminating these traditions, because 
there are, of course, the, the contexts are different with both Sunnism and Shiism, but there are similarities. And they are around the same time these traditions emerge about uh, Tahrif or the falsification of the Quran, starting from the third century. Why, you know, I'm trying to find out why all these Sunni and Shia traditions uh, about Tahrif emerged around the second or third century. And looking at the historical uh, context, if there is something going on at the time, and uh, trying to come up with more um, plausible answer to the question why it is. So this is what I'll be doing for the next uh, three years. And hopefully, inshallah, there will be a book in the end of this research. Thank you very much.